Welcome to the sixth mini lecture in 7505 NSC Project Management. In this particular lecture, we're going to be dealing with risk management. I've mentioned risk in earlier mini lectures. And one of the things you will find in actually doing the course with me is that this is an area that I regard as probably being one of the most important parts of the course itself. Why? Because many projects founder because of improper risk management. The successful projects are the ones that have managed their risk very, very well. And the one thing that I've found working in projects myself, and in fact I've built expertise in project risk management, so it is a particular part of project management that is very, very near to me. But this particular course, we are going to make sure that you go out, first of all, understanding what risk management is, but not only understanding it, but being able to apply it in realistic problems. So what are we going to be doing in this? First of all, we're going to be talking about risk and its importance in projects. We're going to be talking about how risk is managed according to a four-stage project, and we're going to look at risk identification in different types. We're going to be explaining how risks are analysed in terms of probability. Some people talk about likelihood and consequences, and the use of risk mitigation strategies. We're going to describe some of the documentation that's used as part of the risk management process, and we're actually going to get you to apply the risk management principles. So this is a part of the course that's going to be very applied, and I think you'll find it a particularly enjoyable part too. First of all, what's risk itself? Well, risk is the art and science of identifying, analysing and responding to risk factors throughout the life of the project and in the best interests of its objectives. So what are the key words here? It's an art and a science. So there's some mathematics that we can use in it, there's some prediction factors we can use, but there's still an art in it, which means that on certain projects, for example, let's take the Boeing 787, they knew that there would be certain risks in going to large carbon fibre composite structures and they did certain tests, etc. But they still came up with problems that when the structures were put in the test rigs and flexed over a period of time, they had delamination. But they expected to probably get some sort of problem there. The one that they didn't expect was the use of lithium ion batteries. So that when they started delivering aircraft, they found that they started getting overheating and the start of fires in the lithium ion batteries. And the integrator on the team, Talis, who actually did that work, saw a very, very small risk of problems with the lithium ion batteries. But the fact is it came up. So that's what makes risk something that is very much an art and a science. And so with risk itself, we can have our first fellow in the diagram here who just turns his back on risk, knowing full well that probably what's going to happen is he's going to get clobbered by the risks that he hasn't bothered to address. Whereas the other fellow is sitting back and analysing the risks and saying, how can I manage these? And that's what we're going to learn in this lecture, how to really identify and manage risk and not turn our backs on it. So project risk is any possible event that can negatively affect the viability of the project. And the thing is, project risk mustn't be confused with constraints. Sometimes people do. A constraint is something that is going to occur. For example, if you had to erect a hangar up in Darwin in February, we know that that's the wet season, it's going to rain, and so that's going to put your work back. So that's a constraint, it's not a risk. It's going to happen. Okay, so the four stages of risk management. And we'll be going into these much greater depths. But in this mini lecture, it's the risk identification. That is, we look at what are the possible risks that could possibly come up to affect our project. And we build this list of potential risks. The next thing we do is we then say, OK, let's do a risk analysis and prioritise the list. Because there are going to be some risks that we might say, that risk is so small it's not worth worrying about. But some have to be managed. And we'll learn how to do that through being able to work out the risk probability or likelihood and the consequences. The next one is the risk planning itself. That is, once we know the risks and which ones are the really big ones, we can then attack them in order of priority and say, how can we either mitigate that risk or eliminate it completely? And we come up with risk mitigation strategies and plans themselves to actually address the risk. And finally, 
there's a risk monitoring, constantly assessing how we're going with reducing our risk or eliminating it, and we track and control the progress itself. The important thing is that ready, there are many risk management tools available to help you manage the process, but in the end, it is still good human judgment. That is, there is no machine or technology that will automatically help you identify or even calculate the risks themselves. You have to do that. So this is where there is the art and the science coming in. People make a difference in the skill, and I'm particularly keen to get this through to you. And of course, as part of our risk monitoring, as we find out as to how we're learning about risk, we find out what are the lessons learned, and we can go back and again go through the process. So it's a continual loop process, because as we learn about certain risks, we might suddenly realise, hey, there are risks that we haven't looked at. And so we go back to the identification again. So this is the important thing. What are the different types of risks we can come up against? Well, there's a financial risk. That is, there is a financial exposure in developing the project. For example, you might overcommit yourself to doing a project and find that there are so many problems come up that you use up all your budget just in solving those problems themselves. So the important thing that you've got to say is, well, how can we actually reduce that? And for example, Boeing with its 787 said, this is such a big project that if anything goes wrong, we could put the whole company at risk. So they spread it by taking partners on board to develop the different parts of the structure. And Airbus has done the same. There's commercial risk. That is, what's going to be the success of the actual product itself. That is, when the product is sold and used by customers, will it do everything that they thought it would? There's technical risk, the use of using unproven technology. We've spoken about that, carbon fibre composites and lithium ion batteries. There's the execution risk, factors such as de geographic dispersion, physical conditions that can affect the actual risk itself. And we, again, we see this, for example, when we have virtual organisations, that is, work being executed at different sites. And then there's a contracted or legal risk. That is, can we actually meet the agreed terms and conditions that we've signed up to? And one of the things that we'll look at are software projects. We'll see why software has peculiar risks associated with it, and some of the biggest problems we get in projects are associated with softwares. If we look at Boeing's wedge-tail system, uh, for airborne early warning, or Lockheed Martin's Joint Strike Fighter, we'll find out that major problems with those projects have occurred in the software systems because they make up such a large part of the capability. We'll look at a sample risk grid and we can see that by working out the actual probability or the likelihood and looking at the impact of a risk occurring, uh, and, and we can grade these according to a scale of one to five or in percentage terms, we can work out, first of all, how the risks work out on a matrix. And we find out that the extreme risks, those are the ones that we've got to attack immediately. Where are there some with that are minimal risks? And we might find, look, it's, it's cheaper to simply tolerate that risk than to spend money trying to reduce it. So being able to produce a grid like that, and that's something that you'll get out of this lecture, is an important part of risk manager itself. So once we've got the risks, we've got risk mitigation strategies. And as we said, with a risk that's got a very, very small um, impact, we can find, well, we might decide to accept it. Or we can minimise it. That is, we can use mitigation strategies to re reduce the likelihood of the risk occurring or reduce the consequences. Or we can share the risk, and we spoke about this. Uh, this was done with the development of Concorde between Britain and France, the development of the Boeing 787 spread across companies over the world, and the Airbus 380 spread amongst countries within Europe and outside Europe. Or we can transfer the risk. That is, we can shift the risks to another party. And very often, that's what we do in fixed price contracts. For example, if you have a house built and you have a fixed price contract, the builder might start building that house and suddenly storms come through where they can't do any work on the house and so the builder is paying for workers who can't do any work. 
The builder's taken that risk on. You haven't. So these are things that are realistic in the world today. We'll take a look at the documentation that can be done, and there are different tools available. But as I said, the tools are simply means of tracking and controlling. They don't do anything magic for you. So we have our risk register review. This is simply based around an Excel spreadsheet form. We can separate the open and closed risks. That is, uh, we can tell immediately, look in our register, which ones are still active and which ones have been closed because either they've been reduced as far as possible or they've been eliminated. We can separate the threats and opportunities as well. We can look at the what the situation was in terms of the probability and consequences pre-mitigation and we can take a look at post-mitigation as to where we've got it down to in terms of minimal. This is just an example but it's something that's used out in industry and this is a tool that I've used many times myself. As an example, we can see this is an aircraft being tested at Edwards Air Force Base. It's a demonstrator that Boeing is using to take a look at the use of flying wing aircraft as future airliners. You look at that and you say, I wonder how big it is. Well, it's only about five metres wingspan. It's actually a small aircraft. But it's something that they're doing as a demonstrator to investigate all the possibilities of flying wing. And we'll be looking at other examples that different organisations use to understand the risks that are there and to be able to find out as to how to manage those risks. So in this lecture itself, we've looked at risk and its importance in projects. We've looked at risk management in terms of the four-stage project itself. We've looked at risk identification and the different types that are there. We've explained how risks are analysed in terms of probability, or in some cases likelihood, and the consequences and the use of risk mitigation strategies. And we've looked at some of the documentation that can be used as part of a project's risk management process, and you'll get an opportunity to apply this in different exercises throughout the lecture. This is going to be a really important lecture. This is something that not only can help you in projects, it can help you in your professional and private lives. Understanding a risk is a big part of living in the world today. Thank you.